Wow. <laughs> what a call to serve. Uh, you know, I, uh, I saw an earlier version of that presentation last August when I visited DARPA. It's the first time I'd been in the agency in about 20 years. Uh, and what do you know? I became a program manager. <laughs> Uh, but I think not just a call to serve, a call to have impact, I think, was what appealed to me as a, as a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Um, I was like many of you here in this room, happily building technology companies right here in the Bay Area for the last 20 years. And I can tell you that there comes a moment, you know, as, as Sue described, where you imagine what, what is possible with a new technology and then you put everything, heart and soul, into trying to make it happen. And this happened to me actually about a year ago when I saw this work that's on the screen before you. And, and it's a profound piece of work. And, and this is what actually drew me to DARPA, is because I had the experience of realizing when I saw this that we stand on the very brink of a profound technology disruption that is so profound that when you go and you pitch the average venture capitalist in the area, or you try and explain to your friends or parents what might be possible, you can't really write spreadsheets and make business models and projections of what might happen on the other side of that disruption. And so it's very difficult to come up with a structure around which you can build a new company. But my first company out of graduate school at MIT was actually DARPA financed. The research we did at MIT was DARPA funded. And when we said, hey, we've developed a prototype and wanted to spin it out, uh, it, it was a fantastic agency to work with to begin that effort, and that technology ultimately resulted in two of the companies I started subsequently. One group of, uh, of, of patents and, and IP ended up in Google Glass, uh, and another uh, is now fueling uh, data delivery worldwide for mobile television and other media. So I had firsthand experience of starting with that nugget of technology and bringing it to the entire world. And when I saw this work about a year ago, this is uh, by Ahrens and Keller at Genalia, um, that's when the light bulb went off for me in that entrepreneurial moment. And let me tell you what you're seeing. You're actually seeing the brain of a tiny little zebra fish that has been genetically engineered with the tools of synthetic biology so that when the neuron fires in its brain, the calcium rushes in and it fluoresces. So we're giving the instructions to synthesize a protein that changes how the neurons behave so we can interact with them. But not just kind of get a rough idea like we had with fMRI, but to actually resolve, in this case, over 85,000 neurons in real time, individual neuron activity. And when I saw that, I realized that, well, we've been probing neurons with, uh, with electronics well, for near, on, near 30 years. And if you looked at the resolution with which we could interface with the brain, it had slowly progressed up to the you know, hundreds and thousands of neurons. And we were starting to get an idea of what some of the systemological function might be. But just over the last two years, there was an explosion, a radical difference in the scale of interactions we could have with the nervous system. With these optical techniques at Genalia and Howard Hughes and uh, Cal Berkeley, Stanford, these technology investments, we were able to see at a level of resolution roughly comparable to those systems of the brain that we understand the best, the sensory periphery, the things that are closest to the surface of our skull that now we can interact with and not just have models and hypotheses, rough ideas of where blood flow goes, but to understand exactly what each neuron is doing. And I realized that at that point, we've kind of moved from scientific experimentation and discovery of fundamental functions to an ability where we can begin to engineer systems to do interesting things. Now, of course, I was aware of the wondrous work on the prosthetic program that Jeff described where we are taking essentially electronic probes and embedding them in the brain. But the prospect of taking some of these new optical technologies, some new acoustic technologies, and being able to transit the skull and devise systems that interface with all of the independent sensory organs in the subsystems of the brain allows you to think beyond the notion of just restoring lost function and injury and disease but to think about what are some of the more advanced systems and services and industries that we could create 
once we begin engineering these systems. And further, I would say we can look at um, what are the types of things that can be done with increased resolution, increased acuity of information, increased bandwidth in and out of the skull. So to give you an idea, we've had auditory prosthesis for some time. So people with hearing deficits that have problems in their outer ear, we can actually wear a, a, a hearing aid type device on the, on the ear, but extend it with an electronic wire with about 64 contacts that you can kind of thread through. You can see through the inner ear all the way to the cochlea, and we can wrap it around and stimulate electronically the, hairs, the hair cells in, in that ear and actually give you the ability to hear and sense and decode speech. It's noisy. There's only 64 contacts. And you know, if you just imagine a, a Bach uh, a symphony or a Mozart concerto, it's actually much more complicated. But it's good enough to navigate everyday life. It's good enough to understand what you're doing. But there are people that don't even have a cochlea or have had that degenerate through some sort of disease. And if you look a little bit deeper in the nervous system, where those auditory nerves project onto the side of your brain, through surgery, through medical progress, we've actually established there's a beautiful mapping in this tiny little lozenge of, of your cortex where we can actually probe with little electronic signals and elicit tones. And there's a nice spatial map. You poke over here, it's a high tone. You poke over here, it's a low tone. But now, with the new optical technologies, we have the ability to, to stimulate and to read from that area of the brain in incredible individual neural resolution. We can make Mozart's concertos sound like they should. You can hear your baby the way it really sounds when it talks to you. So sensory restoration is a beginning. But it also means that we can think beyond the restorative functions to actual applications that go beyond medicine, beyond clinical treatment. I like to think of communications. I've worked in that field for quite some time. And I can tell you that there's been a really interesting evolution there. So we'll talk more about that. Visually, we can do the same sort of progression in the stimulation with images and video. And looking at how the signals go from the back of your eye, where images are projected onto the surface of the retina, and then through the um, uh, thalamus, and then ultimately to the cortex in the back of your brain. And these areas of the brain are conveniently close to the skull, thankfully, where we can use some of these same techniques and understand how is the surface of your retina mapped to that portion of your cortex. And we've already had technologies where you can poke with the neurosurgeon's electronic probe and excite little bright flashes in your eye. But the challenge has been the level of acuity and the types of imagery that you could represent was limited. And bright flashes is a long way from representing something that you can use in your daily life. But there's been some beautiful work recently where we're beginning to understand more and more of the actual code, not just of how you project an image onto the back of the retina, but what is the language that the neurons speak, the spike trains that go and are projected on the back of your skull. And that means we can begin to think of not just trying to get to some part of your eye, which you, know, you may or may not have if you've been injured in, in, in battle, but we can now start talking about systems where the surface of your retina degrades. This is work by Sheila Nuremberg at Cornell. And we understand the language that that circuit speaks, that biological circuit. She's actually done experiments where she puts the retina in a dish, measures with an electronic probe, what is the language of translation of that image impinging on the retina, and how does it express itself in a language of spikes and codes? And then she built an artificial system to replace it. And now we have a system where you can write directly from this artificial system onto the individual ganglion cells that still survive, not by projecting an image as you and I would look at it, but in this language of odd digital pulses that is the language that those neurons speak. And this principle of understanding and abstracting that neural function in the periphery and applying it to relating ever more complex data we can now extend deeper into the brain, into cortex, and writing there directly. Now, I want to highlight the pace at which this revolution is occurring in our ability to get to these parts of the brain and understand and see what's going on. Um, in a little over a year, we've gone from a first prototype optical bench demonstration of the overall concept 
to a, a, a benchtop prototype of a more detailed instrument. Uh, and now you can see uh, Mark Schnitzer's work at Stanford, uh, just locally here, where they've taken a fluorescent microscope to look at this neural activity, and they've shrunk it to the size of something about the last joint on your pinky. And they've attached it to the uh, heads and skulls of mice, and they can watch the mice thinking and seeing things and hearing things as it runs and traverses different mazes and environments. But we're still a few steps from something that we can interface reliably with people. And the interesting observation is we've made all of this progress in an incredibly short time, and we're still you know, usually using neuroscience postdocs who are hand cobbling you know, Edmund scientific optics and uh, consumer grade CMOS cameras to do these things, which are remarkable. But there's another couple steps over here off the screen that with the right kind of DARPA program, the right kind of multidisciplinary approach, where we can bring state-of-the-art electronics and packaging, state-of-the-art biomaterials, uh, state-of-the-art clinical procedures for implanting the devices and managing the types of interface technologies, computer scientists to take the kind of code and mathematical abstractions of, of the language of the neurons, and we can build another generation of devices. So what kind of a device should we build? What would we build it to do? Um, I think I'd like to start here by giving you a moment in, uh, actually a shining moment in DARPA's history, where at the beginning of the evolution of computers, so back in the 60s, uh, DARPA was investing very, very heavily in the generation of, of first generation of, of room filling, quite literally, computers. And Bob Metcalf, um, a student there, Tom Knight, my old advisor at, at MIT, they were in a room together and with the DARPA sponsor. And, and to hear them tell the tale, there was this moment where they said, well, what if we connected that computer over there to the one in that room over there? And I think the response that they quote was something like, well, what the hell? You can barely make one of them work. Why would you want to connect two of them? <laughs> but there was that moment where they abstracted the notion of bridging one up till that point self-contained, complicated, complex, capable system to another. And of course, you know, fast forwarding a few years, uh, a little bit more DARPA support. Uh, that was the beginning of 3Com, and this is what started as the first conceptual Ethernet modem. In all its ugliness with a coiled acoustic delay, <laughs> uh, can you imagine? But there was that moment where all of a sudden computers could connect to one another and that complexity would, can now grow exponentially with network technologies. And of course, we look forward today and see what has happened with the internet and so on. Um, that was a world-changing technology that because of this investment, because of this faith in something that was high risk, that we didn't understand what would come next. And Bob and Tom, will, they'll tell you, we had no idea that anything like the internet would imagine, but we knew that if we could just abstract that communication function, interesting things should follow. So there's no business model, there was no venture capital plan, but there was DARPA. So I think we can do the same thing because we stand at a very similar junction for bridging from within the skull to without it. Now we're talking about the rich capabilities of the human brain, which we still struggle to create artificial systems which can replicate its function, and connecting that to computer systems and networks. And the technologies that we need to do it, surprisingly, are mostly solved problems, but in other industries, in other applications. We know how to package tiny little bits of ceramic. We know how to make little coils and transmit power. We know how to have tiny little semiconductor parts uh, you know, transmit data very efficiently with increasingly low power, another area of DARPA research, incidentally. We know how to make CMOS cameras, and now we know how to cause neurons to be accessible, both to be read in their activity and to be able to write to them. Uh, you'll hear from Carl Dizeroth and, and others here later this afternoon that are pioneers in the field, not just of reading what neurons do, but in shining light on them and causing them to fire and having the duel of being able to sense. But again, this is another example of a multidisciplinary effort where the state-of-the-art technology Miniaturization, phone packaging, implanting devices, medical materials, optics, photonics, semiconductors. If we apply them, we can build the first generation of cortical modems. So what does that mean for broader industries? So thinking of 
medicine, obvious applications, clinical tools, uh, imagine diabetes and neuropathy, uh, barcode scanner type device to be able to put it where you want to understand is a neural signal getting to the periphery of my diabetic mother's you know, toes. But there are even bigger industries. And so for your entrepreneurial ventures, if you go to a venture capitalist and you say, I have this technology and my first application is going to be a, an FDA approved medical device and they, the eyes roll back in their head, you can say, yeah, yeah, that's the first one. The next one could be in communications. Now, there are some intrinsic design conflicts that have plagued communications. And I, I, I like this example because I happen to have worked on it for a, a decade or two. Um, and there's a conflict between the richness of the stimulus and the data that you can get, the I.O. bandwidth in and out of your head, and the portability of the systems that you can deliver. And as you probably know, each of these has different societal and social uh, barriers. Um, yes, you can get rich data throughput with the Oculus headset, but who wants to wear the headset for more than a you know, sweaty gaming session in a video game parlor for more than half an hour? But what about the Google Glass? Great portability, maybe still some social issues of attaching things to your glasses and looking a little more dorky than you like. But the problem is that you sacrifice resolution and the, the richness of the data that you can visualize. Um, beyond that, you know, the richest sensorium, the highest capability of our data intake is in the visual system. And we have an unfortunate data bottleneck, which is our, our tiny little pupil through which we have to pipe all of these things. So these are fundamental physical limits, size, portability. And if you look at how that's affected devices, it's not just the input, it's also the output. I have this clumsy, low bandwidth thumb interface between my brain and my electronic device. I'm hopeless. Why is it so slow? Speech, I don't ever want everyone to know what I'm doing. Of course, now you see people with the, the tablets. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a plague. It's a plague upon all of us. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? Uh, you know, you look at the evolution of the cell phone industry. And, and it's a very interesting evolution where, you know, from the first commercial product, there was a huge trend towards miniaturization all the way down to, you know, one of my favorites, that old Nokia, you know, 8000 series phones. Um, but then there was a moment where, oh my God, data services. Now we can see richer and richer things. And then the phone started getting bigger because of that, that thirst for more and more data, higher resolution screens. And now I've got an iPhone 6 Plus that's just too damn big. But I still want the data. I still carry it around. But what if we could solve all of these problems by replacing some of these big, expensive parts, large displays, thumb pads, with a cortical modem? And use the frame buffer that you already carry around in the back of your head. And so now we're not talking about just restoring loss function. We're talking about tapping into sensoria that you already have and enhancing it, writing to it, being able to send speech messages so that you hear them. And of course, you know, you look at them uh, in, in actual size, uh, they're really tiny things. They're things that we should be, with the state-of-the-art packaging technology, able to embed in tiny little devices about the size of a couple nickels back to back. And what about the price? Cost of materials goes way down. So now we're talking about greater accessibility in developing countries more general broad access to information and technology uh, in a very equal, equal way. Now, the uh, evolution of communication technologies and how we use it has changed quite a lot um, to the point where, you know, looking at some of these old slides of the, you know, the telegraph where you're tapping on the key and even of those slides where we were actually confined to a wire and couldn't move around with our phones, they look incredibly antique. Can you guys imagine now how we might make this one, state of the art today, how can we make that look antique? Now, beyond talking and hearing, as you would with a, an advanced phone that you don't actually have to pull out of your pocket to hear anymore, we could also do things like relay imagery. And you know, I, I, I often struggle to contrast the long-term DARPA mission with a short-term reality of what is the next realistic step so when I talk about ideas like, yes, I think we can make a cortical modem and have it write images into your visual cortex so that you see them, we're probably going to start with something a little closer to the old Timex watch of the 70s, where you know, blinking red LED, 
It's rough, low resolution, lots of noise. But it was that first moment where we had a technological product. And so that's probably where we'll begin with the cortical implant, where you can have something that imposes the flashing red LED of the time. And for time, it seems like a trivial application. But let me tell you, there are plenty of things that are more important for you to be aware of all the time that could certainly begin on this road. And you don't have to look far in science fiction to get inspiration of what happens once we're on that engineering path. And every successive generation of cortical modem device is now higher resolution, better contrast, more bits of color depth as we understand how to decode and parse you know, the rods and cones and their effect in the interface and how that projects onto the retina. And then once we have that kind of resolution, uh, there's no reason why we couldn't input other devices and extend our range of vision outside of the normal spectrum. And then, of course, we can think about how to control other things besides robot arms and flight simulators. The Google car, uh, you know, one of the outcomes of another DARPA grand challenge on driverless vehicles um, was, a, was a real milestone. And with that grand challenge, as you may have noticed, that you know, Audi and Mercedes and Ford all of the companies now having witnessed that it was possible have immediately stepped in. Tesla and the others, uh, all of them now trying to lead entirely new industries. And I think many of us in this room probably think of, um, you know, the car, driverless, okay, it's a convenience, now I can work in my commute, especially here in Silicon Valley, it takes me forever to get to the venture capitals from the East Bay. Uh, <laughs> but you know, on the, on the flight out, I sat next to a fellow named Eric Bridges, who was about 35 years old, he lost his vision when he was 17. And we started talking, and he had his seeing eye dog. Um, and when he found out I worked for DARPA, you should have seen him. He knew exactly who we were, and he talked about this specific program, the driverless car. And he said, for the first time since I lost my vision, by myself, I got into a car, I drove to In-N-Out Burger, I got a burger, and I came back. <laughs> for us, not a big deal. For Eric Bridges, life-changing. Um, and the idea of the cars that are more and more capable, and the interfaces that start even very simple, but take me to In-N-Out Burger. Just thinking it, making it happen in a car, world-changing. So let me close with three requests to all of you. The first one is, as I said, what we need to make this type of program to address these entire new industries successful is a multidisciplinary approach. We need the computer scientists, the best technologists in electronics and integration, partnership with companies that can take these new technologies and, and develop them venture capitalists and private equity companies that are interested in sharing the risk and making these things happen faster. Secondly, that whole Silicon Valley ecosystem that has been my home has actually taught us some really interesting lessons about how you can take older business practices where it used to take large investments and when we talk about you know research and development and then you know, technology refinement, and then scale up to manufacture and product definition, and then manufacturing. They've taught us in any number of fields that these things can be compressed. With additive manufacturing, with rapid prototyping technologies, with the cloud services in developing data systems and software releases rapidly, all of these things now can be compressed. But the medical technologies industry hasn't really taken advantage of a lot of those realizations. And so one of the things that I would like to see is earlier engagement, even in the type of programs that we're structuring at DARPA, where we bring in state-of-the-art industrial design, state-of-the-art product definition, state-of-the-art rapid prototyping and assembly into the DARPA programs as the technologies are being developed. So that hopefully, the chasm between that moment of the first product definition and the ultimate commercial success is much shorter. And then finally, the last thing I'd like to close with is um, that today's focus on the sensory systems of the brain uh, is conveniently limited, I think, by the fact that those are the parts of the brain that are closest to the skull. They're the parts that we understand the best, that we can get to most easily. Um, 
And that's the program focus for, for what we will begin at DARPA. But in time, we're going to develop the tools and the technologies to peer and, and, and write deeper and deeper into the brain where we will expose and understand and be able to interface with your memories, your intent, your emotions. And yes, there are clinical opportunities and opportunities for good, but I think it's very, very important and I'd like to call on everyone in this room to be aware that there's a big difference between what we can in principle do technologically and what we should be doing and in fact do or not do. And so I'd like to call on you to engage a broad community, have deep discussions, think deeply, and apply noble American principles of high ethics and higher purpose to make those decisions by the time we have the ability to do them. So that's what I'm working on. Um, when, uh, well, one, one more point, when we, when we close, every human endeavor has been fueled by some technology and innovation. Stone Age, Bronze Age, Agricultural Age, Industrial Age. Without the violin, there was no virtuoso. Without the rocket engine, we couldn't reach the moon or now imminently other planets. Without the internet, I mean, you get the idea. Those ages have progressed because of those technological innovations and because of taking risks. Who would like to go from the industrial age to the age of the mind? Can you help me? Who wants to help? 